Now, this is going to be important because the world has a very inappropriate, warped mindset concerning about relationships and sex. That's why we're going to be covering this important lesson today. Because a lot of people don't understand about the importance that of sex where the Lord blessed us with that, but it has been corrupted, it has been filthy in the eyes of the world. And That's that is right. wickedness and that is sin. And the Lord does not tolerate that. So it's Amen. very sad to see where our world has fallen upon, but that's how it is, right? That's how it is. That's how life is. That's how the wickedness of this world is like. Okay, anyways, we're going to come down to the book of Genesis chapter 24. What is marriage? Let's define that first, right? What is marriage before we come to sex? So let's look at Genesis chapter 24, verse 67. So Dr. Ruckman, he would teach that marriage is actually where it's not where you get a wedding ring band and then you have to go through a ceremonial process, but basically it's when flesh joins flesh. Right. Now when you hear that, then you realize the weight and the seriousness about sex. Well, then fornication, then, Pastor, uh, I shouldn't take that lightly. Yeah, because basically that's what God considers a sacred marriage. Amen. Sacred marriage. Amen. So then people, they mess up on that, and they think that this is something you can mess around with. And do you know how many marriages and divorces that you went through just now? Wow. All right, look at Genesis chapter 24, verse 67. And Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent. See, they're going to do the sexual act. And took Rebecca, notice, and what? She became his wife, and he loved her. So notice that the sexual action is where God defined it to be as marriage. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31. Ephesians chapter 5, and verse 31. This is the reason why we take divorce seriously. We take premarital sex seriously. That it is not tolerated in the Christian church. It is absolutely not tolerated. Some people might say, oh, you're just so uh, pur puritanical and you're just old-fashioned and you're just being weird and stuff like that. But actually, no, you just uh, you take sex lightly. That's your problem. Yeah. See, that's your problem. You take sex lightly. You don't understand the serious weight when God thinks about sex. You think it's something to play games with. That's why you don't divorce, and how many Americans, like perhaps even perhaps over 50% of Americans already went through a divorce? Wow. Wow. Can you imagine that? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that speaks volumes, man. How about that? That speaks volumes right there. You take it very lightly. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31. For this cause shall a man, look at this action, leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife. See that? So that very act where you're away from uh, the family and you are together with your wife. And it says wife, joined to wife. That's considered marriage. And they two shall be one flesh. See that? When two flesh becomes one. That's what sex is. Okay. Um, I trust that the video has all the picture. I can't really see that well. If it does, then that's awesome. All right. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. All right, Romans chapter 1. All right, Romans chapter 1. And we're going to look at verse 24. Now, people, if you take sex very lightly, that it's a game to experiment with and then to do whatever you want, that's why it goes from premarital sex to, exper uh, to experimenting more things that are exciting to your flesh. And then you would think that divorce is like drinking water. Then what happens? Once you hit something in that pleases your flesh, what is the tendency of the flesh? To get into something harder and harder and harder. Mm -hmm. Then what happens? Then what happens is you hit to the point of uh, homosexuality. Wow. Look at Romans chapter 1 verse 24. Okay. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through what? The lust, the lust of their own hearts. That's the key. When you keep following your lust, what does God give you up to? To dishonor their own bodies between themselves. See, you're dishonoring the temple that God gave to you. Because this is something that you can mess around with. So look what God says at verse 26. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. 
For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with when, men with men working that which is unseemly. See what God says? So God doesn't think that homosexuality is normal. Uh, let me repeat that again just in case some of you didn't know and you just got shocked just now. Homosexuality is not normal. Amen. That's what God says. God says over here that it's vile affection. It's against nature. So see, it is natural to have sex. God understands that. It is natural. So God understands that. But see, people take it lightly. And when you take it lightly and then you play with it and mess around with it, that's why what happens is you get rid of something natural God gave to you. You get rid of something natural that God gave to you. One man, one woman, together for life. Oh, you, you don't care about that. Uh, look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 23. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 23. This could be true, but perhaps the first sex that is mentioned in the Bible is actually with Adam and Eve. That's possible. Because notice that the wording of Ephesians 5, where the sexual action uh, shows the marriage, that wording is used the same way at Genesis chapter 2, verse 23. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, look at this, shall a man leave his father and, and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now look at that. See, God sees it as a beautiful picture. Amen. God sees it as something beautiful and pure. And this may have been the first sexual action mentioned in the Bible. Now, uh, if people are wondering how to do marriage, it is as follows. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So some people might think after hearing this, oh yeah, that's right. So then uh, I can just have sex with my partner and that's considered marriage. I don't have to go through the law. No, actually God wants to make sure that in marriage things are done legally, legally. Every culture has uh, different rules on how they do marriages. And in the Old Testament, it definitely was different back then, but God doesn't want anything done illegally. Now look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39. The wife is bound by the what? Law, as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. So notice that God, he doesn't like it when marriage violates law. See that? So God, he wants to make sure that things are done legally. So we believe, so I can't do a marriage unless you do things legally. You got to understand that. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. We're going to look at 1 Timothy chapter 5. And then we'll read verse 11. 1 Timothy chapter 5. And then we'll read verse 11. Another thing is this. You can't just marry who you want. D did you hear what I just said? You can't just marry who you want. You got to be careful of that. The reason why is because you're going to be together for life. Do you realize that? For life. Amen. For life. If you're going to be together for life, then you got to make sure that uh, when you do the marriage, that it is done in a way that is the right decision, the right woman, and somebody that you don't have to just mess around and then you can divorce and then catch up with the right woman next time. You hear that? Well, the person can eventually get saved, uh, even though the person's an unbeliever. No, you better watch out for that. You, God does not allow that in marriage. So a lot of people, they take marriage lightly. They think that it's a joke. Okay, let's look at some places that you need to know. We're going to look at 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 11 through 15. It has to be a saved person and a testimony that is not against Christ. Look, we're not looking for a, a woman or a man who is like, absolutely perfect in Christian and has a stellar testimony of uh, unbroken church membership and read through the Bible constantly. We know everyone is flesh. And sometimes the spouse improves the spiritual growth 
through marriage, and some of you have experienced that. Amen. However, you got to realize that the bottom line is, is that if the person's life is something that can be against Christ, so the person, let's say, is smoking and drinking, well, then through my marriage with this person, the person will eventually spiritually grow and get out of it. No, that's not right. It's got to be a saved person and a testimony that is not against Christ that Satan can find opportunities and use against it. We understand people spiritually growing, but we cannot allow where there are opportunities that Satan can use to attack you or against Jesus Christ. So look at 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 11. But the younger widows refuse, for when they have begun to act wanton against Christ, they will marry. Now, what does God consider this kind of marriage? Having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. And with all they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also and busy bodies, speaking things which they ought not. I will therefore that the younger women marry, uh, bear children, Guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. For some are already turned aside after Satan. So notice that the point here is that God, he does not like marriages where it has to do with the woman with a bad testimony that Satan can use. He wants the woman to get married to not mess up her life, but the marriage has to be in line where it is... Uh, where it doesn't give advantage to the enemy. You see that, right? So that's the idea. So you got to make sure that you're, the person that you're marrying won't have a testimony that can jeopardize your testimony too. Because marriage is, is going to change your life. It's going to affect you no matter. Oh, I'll be spiritually strong. I'll affect that person. No, it's going to affect you. It's going to affect you if, not, if you're not careful. That's the reason why you have to take this thing seriously. A lot of people don't take it that seriously. Now, some interesting pointers concerning about sex. This is a part of human nature. We saw that in Romans chapter 1, right? It is a part of nature. So uh, Sigmund Freud, who is totally messed up in the mind, that's why he believed that sex is an innate drive, which he called libido. So his idea is that all the actions that we commit today is from two things, sex and violence. So anything that you do, which is overtly ridiculous, is that he'll attribute it is because of something sexual that you went through in your childhood or something violent that you had a long time ago, which is why you made this mistake today. So he attributes it to those two things. So obviously he's off his rocker, but the devil has an element of truth somewhere. The element of truth is this, is that Freud knew that within us it was a natural drive to have sex and violence. Now those are two things that you want to know. Because why is that? Because that is, you got to realize, that is one of the key big things with human nature today that you want to understand. So sex... An innate nature, a monster within us, so to speak, right? Sex can be turned into something that's a monster within our nature if we're not careful, which is why I drew it this way. And these two things can be called violence and sex. Now, sex is more of the focus of today, but it's interesting that violence can accompany or follow along sex. That is very interesting. Look at mass murderers, for example who do rape crimes. Look at that one, for example, right? They go from rape and then to murder. There's something dark there. There's, some, there's a deep monster inside that you have to be careful. Look, think about Hollywood. What is the theme in Hollywood? The theme in Hollywood, movies, stories, that make it climactic and exciting, is sex and violence. Sex and violence. Dr. Upman used to say, love and death is this theme of great plays and movies and tragedies, etc. Yeah. Love and death, love and death. Why? Why is that so important to the devil? Because Satan knows why love and death is so important. There was a being called Jesus Christ who loved you enough and Amen. bled and died for you on the cross of Calvary. When he bled and died for you on the cross of Calvary, a lot of people don't understand this, is that Thank it was Lord. an act of love 
and death. Amen. Praise the Love Lord. and death. So God knows how important it is. So it is through the act of love and death that we are able to have eternal life. Amen. And it Amen. is an important thing. But the devil, he wants to corrupt the thing. He wants to corrupt the thing. Right. Now, so see, movies and plays, don't think that they're very unique authors and they're very smart. Yeah. No, the Bible was way ahead of them. Yeah. They're just copying uh, what they got from the Word of God. Besides, who gave them that gift and that brain to create mm -hmm. such plays, right? It is the creator and the author of love and death. Right. It is the creator and author of love and death. Now, obviously, I'm not saying that God, he uh, created death where, uh, or it's something evil. It is actually a consequence of our own actions. Right. But the point is, is that the author, he is the author because he uses love and death where it can magnify his power and his glory and rescue mankind. Amen. But Satan, he steals that for himself. Numbers chapter 33. Numbers chapter 33. Do you know that idolatry, why is this so heavily connected with sex? Did you notice that? Yeah. Pagan idolatry, so heavily connected with sex. During the pagan cultures, they connected sexual body parts with idols. They would do orgies. In front of the idol, that's what the children of Israel did with the golden calf, didn't they? Right, right. The Catholic Church even, you might say, no, it's holy and sacred. They forbid marriage for the priest. Uh, you don't know. I mean, that uh, Semiramis Nimrod, the baby and the mother, that figure. Mm -hmm. I mean, they teach a horrible, uh, they taught a horrible teaching that I don't know if they recanted. But basically that Jesus is so angry, see, violent. That the only way to appease him is that Mary would breastfeed him. That's how dark and wicked that thing is. How about that, huh? Now, look at this, though. What accompanies idolatry with sex? Satan sees something. Pictures, verse 52. Verse 52. Then ye shall drive out all the inhabitants of the Lamb from before you, and destroy all their pictures and destroy all their what molten images and quite pluck down all their high places now look at that see during the timeline of the pagan culture they didn't have tv but they had pictures why pictures is supposed to be similar with idols something they can see and feel but if you know your history of idols a lot of it is attributed to something sexual why not pictures as well so we live in a day and age think about it a lot of people and young children they would not be exposed to the sexual norms now it's called norms now because of something they watched on tv yeah. computer cell phone etc the devil puts it in every person's hand now and everybody sees and knows so the devil corrupted people uh through his corruption of sex and gives them a distorted view of sex. So he spread it now to everybody. Why? Because picture, the, the key thing with sex, where people know it all has to do with the eyes. Oh, yeah. Now, Amen. look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 28. Matthew chapter 5, verse 28. Here's another thing how Satan might catch you. You might say, well, I don't look at pictures, Pastor, so I'm okay. I have no TV. I have no technology. Oh, you don't know how Satan can get you. He gets people through this uh, sex means very powerfully. And you know how he gets it? He still gets you with pictures. You might say, how? Through your imaginations. Imagine. Matthew chapter 5, verse 28. The Bible say, But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in what? In his heart. The Bible says with her, adultery with her in his heart. Meaning there's a sexual action already in place within the heart. And God says that's sin. That's sin. How about that? So we're also going to look at 2 Corinthians 10.5. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. Second Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. Hopefully you understand how much powerful sex is. Some of you don't understand that. Sex is extremely powerful. Why? Because it's a natural use that God blessed us with. 
but it became a curse because of what the devil is using it for. So you got to watch out for that. Okay, so let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. It's a memory verse that you should have memorized uh, from the past month. Casting down what? Imaginations. Imaginations. Notice who's, who's connected to that. Devils. And every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. See, that's, those are devils. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. See, God wants your imagination, your mind to be held captive. To be held captive. So in this, uh, this empty space that you might see is basically your heart or your mind. That's what I try to depict it as. The world of your brain and your heart. Your mind and heart. And in here, you don't want to let these two little monsters, who are actually very big and a huge threat, sex and violence to start invading in and then here comes that devil coming in right here comes that devil coming in using these two monsters to fill up the emptiness you know why it's empty over here because that's your mind an idle mind is the devil's workshop you should be filling it up with scripture if you keep it empty these two means you'll be entertaining them okay watch out for that now uh, let's look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3. Now look, Satan, he's, uh, you have to realize how dangerous this is, which will explain our practices that you might think as too legalistic or strict. You know why? Because we're trying to avoid this monster. That's the reason why. Why? Because Satan, he's going to try to catch you through his devices, right? Television, computer, internet, cell phone etc but he can't get you through that so what he's going to try to attack you then is through your mind imagination but how can the imagination start to be entertained you have to put something in your thought to begin with right so how can that begin that's why he may not catch you satan might not catch you to do the sexual act but he will catch you pay attention now and this is why you accuse me of legalism. He will attack you through sexual, not sexual acts, but sexual appearances. Do you understand that? All right. You take that lightly. You think that, oh, you're just being too strict and etc. Why do you have to make rules in dating? Why can't two people, opposite, uh, my partner and I, live together even though we're not married and etc. You know what you're entertaining? You're ent entertaining this guy. You're entertaining this guy over here. Why? Because Satan can't catch you in the act, so he's going to catch you through appearances. Okay, let's look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3. Think about it. When two people start living together, or when teenagers go out really late at the middle of the night, your daughter with somebody else's son, what, is, what, is, what do you think people are? You think people are stupid? Or they're going to talk about, you know what they're doing. You know what they're doing. And they'll be talking about it. And you know what? God says, let that not be named among you where there is sex outside of marriage. Look at Ephesians 5, 3. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once what? Amen. Named among you. Why? As becometh what? Saints. saints. You're supposed to be a saint. I mean, Catholic thinks saints are very holy people, right? Well, if you're going to be a holy person, I mean, that's not being holy. If you uh, take lightly of how you appear in the eyes of others, because why are they going to name about you? Oh, they're living together, so we know that they've been, uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh, uh, uh, the person, uh, they're out late at night, even though that they're, uh, they're not grown adults, and uh, they're out really late at night, and ha-ha-ha. Uh -huh. And then kids talking about it in high school, did you do it? Did you do it? Stuff like that. See, let it not be once named. That's a horrible testimony. Well, I ain't going to do it and stuff like that. It's not the act Satan is attacking you. It's what? Appearance. 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5. You don't know this verse, do you? 1 Thessalonians 5, 22. God didn't just command you to abstain from evil. He commanded you to abstain from all appearance of evil. Appearance of evil. 
You know what the new King James Version and then all the modern versions do? They don't take that seriously. So they go all kinds of evil. Yeah. All sorts of evil. They don't say appearance itself. Right. God says it's appearance. Yeah. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5.22. Abstain. See? Abstinence. Oh, that don't work and that's horrible how you're making them abstain from this and this. They should have a little bit of fun. No, God believes in abstinence from all appearance. Mm -hmm. Appearance of evil. Call me a Puritan, I'd rather go by the Bible. Because I'd rather be called a Puritan by the world than a corrupt, uh, than a corrupt infidel by God when I go at the judgment. Take your pick, what you want to be. Look at Jude 1, 18. Jude 1, 18. Here's something else that you don't understand. Now, God forbid that I have this in my church, all right? God forbid that I have this in my church. And because why? Because all the other churches, I guarantee you, 90% of their people have messed around with something or living together or don't abstain from appearances of evil. They, uh, they, don't, they take this thing lightly, God's gift of sex. 90% of the people have fornicated, living together, or messed around with something or with the appearance of sex. Let it not be named among San Jose Bible Baptist Church. Amen. Amen. That, can, that is not... That cannot be. That is not right. Look at Jude 1.18. You might say, why is that? Because bottom line is this. Think about it. Uh, why do we make a big deal about uh, setting up rules concerning dating, especially for people uh, who may not be old enough? Why is it that we make a big deal about not staying, uh, about it doesn't look like a good testimony where it's pretty much late at night? with uh, these two opposite sex individuals. Why is it that we say living together, that is not right? Why do we make a big deal about dressing appropriately, dressing modestly? You don't show too much flesh. Because bottom line is this, you cannot do these things without encountering a sensual atmosphere. That's impossible. You cannot do these things without actually encountering a sensual atmosphere. And if not you, the other person will. Uh, okay. Okay. Some people don't think that. Oh, we're just friends and oh, you don't know about the other individual. And by the way, even if you're such a special exception and the other person is such a special exception, don't think that six billion people that you encounter that all that rule applies to them. Yeah. It's impossible. You create a sensual atmosphere and that already violates scripture at Jude 1 18 how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts these be they who separate themselves see you separate yourself from the rules and what's appropriate you don't care you separate yourself sensual having not the spirit be careful when uh, you isolate yourself with somebody that you like and that you create that sensual atmosphere you know what God sees that as at verse 18? Here, if you're very honest, you're walking after your own lust. Yeah. You're not walking after the Spirit. Bottom line. I mean, look at your own heart at verse 18. Why do you make a big deal about that? Because uh, why, why make a big deal out of it unless your flesh wants it? All right, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. So see, it's what your flesh wants. It might not be sexual for now. See that? But it's still nevertheless your lust that you want to please your flesh because it's what your flesh wants. It's not something sexual at the beginning. And then when you in, do that encountering, whether it be inappropriate dressing, where it displays the flesh, uh, where it's living together or etc., anything that has to do with the appearance of evil, it's impossible not to create a sensual atmosphere after that. Okay, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I mean, come on, uh, are you honest people and don't you have a nature? It's, it's natural within our human nature to have this. That's a natural thing right. that God has, all right? So come on, if you're truly honest of heart of hearts, look at yourself. That never happened one time in your whole life. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2 through 3. Now, the sexual problem, if we're going to see sexual corruption... We know that the uh, one who's the author of it is Satan. So Satan usually is the one who messes everything up. 
<laughs> we blame everything on the devil, don't we? <laughs> That's usually the gist. But look at this. It may have started what Satan did with Eve. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent, look at that word, beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Notice that Paul uses the language of verse 2. It's cheating on God. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have spoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Contrast to clean virginity. Contrast is serpent beguiling leave. There may have been a sexual corruption there. Beguile, if you look up that word, it can mean seduce and charm. Seduce and charm. Which is very interesting, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We're not going to go over there. You've probably learned that in my previous studies. But the tree of knowledge and good and evil that she ate from, the Bible says that Satan is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So that's pretty interesting. So there may have been a sexual uh, act problem that started at the Garden of Eden. That's why it makes sense when you look at John chapter 8, verse 44. John chapter 8, verse 44. What's Satan's goal then? Satan's goal is that you follow along his lust with him mm -hmm. in this dark path in creating sexual monsters. We're going to look at John chapter 8 and we'll read verse 44. The Bible reads here, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. How about that? But isn't it interesting that this guy follows along? Keep reading. He was a what? Murderer. From the beginning. Look at that guy. He's following along here. This guy always seems to accompany sex. Let's look at Genesis chapter 6 and Daniel 2. Genesis chapter 6 and Daniel 2. That's why it can make sense if Satan did start something. It would make sense that his minions would follow along the same example as what their leader would do. Go to Daniel chapter 2 and Genesis chapter 6. The sons of God, as Jesus said one time, that there is uh, the angels, uh, they don't marry up in heaven. So then when they see these human women down on earth, they had a sexual problem. They wanted them so badly. So then because of that, they what? They just had sex and took women for themselves. Which is why you get these disturbing uh, movies of gods, of mythologies of gods coming down and having intercourse with human women, or even raping them, which there's an element of truth with that one, which is very scary. And sci-fi shows of aliens grabbing human women for themselves. Now look at Genesis chapter 6. Look at verse 2. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Now, isn't it interesting? What accompanies sex again? Remember? Violence, right? Well, does that happen? Maybe we should look at verse uh, 7. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air. Now look at this. This shows right here that the sons of God, their activity is not with just humans, but with animals. So that gets really dark now. It gets really dark. Verse 11, the earth also was corrupt before God. So we know, sexually corrupt, we already know that. But look, and the earth was what? Filled with violence. Look at that. This guy always accompanies this guy. If you're not careful, you're not careful. Daniel chapter 2, in the tribulation, it will also happen. Notice that these are not humans. These are other beings, other beings who mingle with the humans here at the tribulation. Look at this one. The Bible says at verse 43, And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they, whoever they are, shall mingle themselves with the who? Seed of man. These iron people are mingling with Humans, humanity. How about that? Repeating Genesis 6. All right, let's go to 
2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and we'll look at verse 2 again. Now, if we're to look at all these things together about demonic activity through sex, think about it is so interesting that these devils, whenever they try to get us to worship idols, and remember how idols are connected to uh, sex, and God, he would view that as a spiritual fornication. Mm. Revelation 17, he calls uh, that uh, wicked system, Babylon, as the mother of harlots. The doctrine of Jezebel as trying to seduce serv servants to commit fornication. That's how God sees it at. When Israel went after idols, what did God call that? You are being a whore. You're cheating on me. What did Paul say in 2 Corinthians 11? When you're not living for the Lord, but for the world, the idols of your heart, etc., God sees that as cheating on him. That's Satan's goal. Satan's goal is to make you, look at this. People think Satan just wants me to commit homosexuality or fornication. No, that's not it. Anything that, cre anything that has to do with sexual corruption, anything, all the way to the sexual act, to the sexual appearance itself, even to your spiritual walk with Jesus Christ. Wow. Wow. All right, now do you see how serious this is? Yeah. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2 to 3. What's the point of Satan using sex? What, what's the point? The point is this. He wants to taint something pure and simple. That's the bottom line. Remember Genesis 2 when Adam and Eve had the sexual action? Uh, they were in simplicity, in innocence. They said, the Bible says they were both naked, but they were not ashamed. Mm -hmm. See that? Mm -hmm. So notice over here that they were not ashamed. Why? Because it's something pure and innocent and simple. Amen. Satan's goal is, I want to corrupt that. Satan's goal is, I want to corrupt that. That's why he takes sex where he, he creates it. Listen up now. He loves to make it where it creates complicated situations that are exciting and stir up your blood. Did you hear what I just said? Uh, we're going to look at verse 2. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I, I espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a what? Chaste virgin to Christ. Satan loves to taint that. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility. So your mind should be corrupted from the what? Simplicity. That is in Christ. Sex should be something simple and pure, right, but right. it became very complicated now. Complicated where we try to uh, ante up, where we try to ante up the sexual level. And then now you become this kind of pansexual uh, person where it's, sex is very complicated. And you have to teach, what, 30, 30 areas of the rainbow, if not more than 100, about how complicated sex is? That perverts and corrupts God's gift. That's Satan's goal. So what? that's why you better watch out for fornication. Why? Because high schoolers, what do they like? The, sex, the thrill of sex. Why? Because uh, when they hear about, oh, this person's a virgin, then what's the automatic thinking? Oh, I want to taint that. See, that's dark. That's very dark. Satan puts something well within teenage years. That's why uh, husband and wives... Sometimes they don't enjoy their thrill. Why? Because they don't like the simplicity and purity that they have in their relationship. They want something else in life. Mm -hmm. See, let's complicate things a little bit more. Make more exciting scenarios. See that? That's why they commit adultery. Mm -hmm. And some people love, it, love adultery because of that excitement, that thrill, of that complex scenario that you just created. And then if you love that virginity that you want to taint and corrupt, Guess what? It gets darker then. Then it goes where uh, really old guys, and this happened to preachers too, where really, uh, God, I have be preachers. Yeah. All right? Jack Scott is very infamous for that, uh, uh, for that scandal. And a lot of other pastors too, which is really bad. But overage people committing the sexual action with minors. Why? Because of that virginity, that younger level, purity simplicity it gets so dark that's why it explains muhammad's actions what right yeah. 
when he wanted to take that six or five year old and then officially get the nine year old when she reached nine years old, then it's officially marriage or something like that, gets into pedophilia. That's why the, if you dig deep into Hollywood, it gets really dark there. It gets really dark where pedophilia is involved. Why? Because you're so used to seeing fornication there. The appearance of evil there, right? You want to complicate it, get something more exciting. That's why you get these dark elites involved where there are pedophile rings and etc. Yep. Connected to Hollywood. Chew on that for a while. and So you want to take this lightly now? You think that you can keep watching Hollywood and have a free, clean mind and it's okay? And then have that kind of music industry display that sexual sexuality and the movies? No, because then what happens is you're so used to it, you want something more. And then this street guy comes out. And then you get infamous cases. I mean, the liberals were too slow to catch up. We already knew this a long time ago. It's no surprise that, uh, uh, I forgot his last name, Harvey, what, Weinstein? Weinstein. Yeah, Weinstein. I mean, he's, the, he's not the first. He's one of the last people, and then it's still continuing on. And these actresses uh, talking about, oh, man, he did this to me. And then Kevin Spacey doing that with some guys, too. I mean, this is dark, man. Yeah. Why? You're so used to seeing this. And you don't think appearances are a big deal. No. All right, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Yeah, I'm preaching, right? Mm -hmm. I'm preaching. That's why this is an important lesson that I want to teach. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and we'll look at verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and we'll read verse 7 through 8. Now, some people say, well, uh, Pastor, um, I have some questions now. So I understand that these things are evil concerning homosexuality, fornication, adultery, and then divorce, etc., etc. So all these things are wicked and wrong. Of course, uh, with divorce, there are, three, uh, there are three grounds where you can do divorce because God understands that, especially if you have a dangerous husband who is after your wife and your, uh, who is after the wife and kids. Okay, we get that. So there are grounds for divorce. But aside from all that, we know that all those things generally, it's sin. Then the question is, then what about being single forever? I mean, is that a sin? So, or is that a gift? God sees it as a gift. There's nothing wrong. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 7. For I would that all men were even as I myself, Paul says. Why? But every man hath his proper gift of God. It's a gift. One after this manner, another after that. I say, therefore, to the unmarried, see that? And widows, it is good for them to, for, it is good for them if they abide even as what? I. So notice here that, the Bible says that it is a gift that there's nothing wrong with that. The issue, though, is keep your hand here. Keep your hand here. Go to uh, 1 Timothy 4. This is where it gets dangerous. Look at 1 Timothy 4. You are not right with God if you claim to be very pious and you uh, live an aesthetic life and be all monkish and say, I'm going to serve Jesus all the way like the Apostle Paul when your natural tendency and inclination is to have sex. Because then that's not a gift God has given to you to be single. Right. See that? It's a gift. Instead, the gift that the Lord has given to you is this one. That's why Paul says everyone has a proper gift. See that? God gives everyone a gift. It's a gift thing. I mean, look, this is not evil. It's a gift. But it becomes evil when you reject this gift God has given to you. And then what's going to happen is your natural tendency will become unnatural and dark if you're not ca careful. Roman Catholic priest, pedophile. Excuse me. All right, let's go to 1 Timothy 4. Right? Right. Look at 1 Timothy 4. That's what they teach. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing. See, that's seducing. Spirit and doctrines of devils. What is the doctrine of the devil? Verse 3, forbidding to marry. God is not against people being single, but he's against people enforcing uh, prohibition against marriage. God says, no, it's a natural thing. People think that, oh, uh, abstinence doesn't work and that's so evil that you refrain them from something natural. No, this is your problem, okay? 
We don't believe in abstinence. We believe in sex. We do believe in sex. It's just got to be at the right timetable and the right person, you fool, you moron. Right. You know why I'm angry? Because that's how they brainwash you. Yeah. Amen. Evil, Amen. wicked people. Of course we're not doing, uh, we're not promoting abstinence. We're, we promote sex, but it's got to be with the right person, right time period. What's wrong with that? You don't care about time period and people. That's why you get so many messed up divorces and you get children crying after, when am I going to visit daddy after the divorce? And then mommy and daddy having fights and then somebody leaving some woman pregnant and then women going through abortions. Right. This is your fruit, America. Yeah. Wicked you. You deserve hell. Yeah, wicked America. Man, this is sad. Yeah. Now look, before people kick me out and I get banned on the internet, look, we all deserve hell. Yeah. I realize that. Amen. If I can't say that, then YouTube is stupid, man. Look, we all deserve hell. The internet is stupid then. We all deserve hell fire. It is by God's grace and his love and death, his act. Yeah. That we can be redeemed and have freedom Thank you, Lord. and enjoy life and this gift that he's given to us. Thank you, Lord. All right. Uh, let's look at... All right, enough preaching. Uh, so, see, forbidding marriage is a sin. Why? Because go back to 1 Corinthians 7, 9. What does it say? But if they cannot contain... See that? God understands that. They can't contain. Let them marry, for it is better to marry than to what? Burn. See that? God doesn't want them burn. But see, you're making a whole bunch of priests burning. And then they commit like pedophilia actions. And then so bad at Boston that liberal Hollywood had to make a movie about you. That's how bad you guys are. All right, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5. Now, here's another thing is this. So then, see, we're not against sex. People think we're such a bunch of Puritans, all right? Look, grow up, man. You've just been so brainwashed by the liberal school system. All right, look. Sex is a gift from God. And not only that, it's not something that's to be repressed. And it's full of legalism rules. So people are wondering, okay, then what are the boundary lines of sexual actions then, right? So look, uh, number one, it is none of my business what you guys do in the bed. All right? And I don't want to know. So the, some people are wondering. Some people ask these questions to John Piper and stuff like that. Is, uh, can I do oral sex and etc. Look, uh, none of my business. It should only be in the bedroom. And it's more simple, Amen. simple than you think. That's what God wants it, right? Yeah. Pure and simple. Why do you complicate it? Because you've been messing around with the world where they took oral sex and other sexual actions into such depravity. Now you're questioning which sexual action can I do, right? When it should be simple and a gift. The Lord didn't put like boundary lines. Uh, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5. So this might be helpful for you concerning that one. Look, we're not, it's not as puritanical as you think, okay? Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again. He's talking about man and wife. That Satan tempt you not for your what? Incontinency. Incontinency means sexual appetite. So notice here that at verse 5, God doesn't want the man and the wife to defraud each other. It's actually a violation if you don't do the sexual actions together. It's defrauding your lover. So God says that the lovers, they should not defraud each other. Amen. They, sh they should be together. Why? Because then Satan can tempt you with sexual appetites. That's right. Now That's right. some marriages that I've counseled, I only mention this briefly, and I don't go into like uh, gross detail, but I do mention this in marriage counseling because I believe it's important. There's too many divorces, too much cases of adultery, and then dark things going on in the home. So I always mention this in marriage counseling. I read them 1 Corinthians 7, 5, that don't defraud each other of, uh, of this gift God has given to you. Amen, so, amen. man, don't defraud that to your wife. That's right. All right, she can use some love That's as right. well as uh, the wife don't do that to the husband. That's he can right. use some love. Otherwise, don't blame them when they cheat on you, when they mess around with something. That's why it's so important that, uh, why? Because Satan's going to tempt you with the sexual appetite. That should be used for each other, not for the devil's purpose. 
Look at Hebrews 13, verse 4. Hebrews 13, verse 4. What do I mean that it's none of my business? It's only between you and the spouse and God. Why do I say that? Because that's how it should be. All right? We're not going to give you a bunch of rules. This is how you should do this act. We're not going to do that. Okay? You know why? Because God automatically sees it as holy. The bed. But the limitation is only in that marriage bed when you do it. All right? That's the limitations. You don't do it parading it in front of the whole world and all that kind of stuff. I mean, there are people displaying and talking about that. It's so messed up. Playing it in TV, like, do it, do the act. And not only that, these actresses and actors, they're cheating on their husbands when they're doing that kind of stuff. What is that messed up, man? Look at Hebrews chapter 13. Uh, we'll read verse 4. Marriage is honorable in all. It's honorable. And the bed what? Undefiled. That's the limitation. And keep it there. And we don't need to see a TV screen, Hollywood. All right? You don't need to put that in the movie so that your ratings can go up. Let it burn for all I care, the, the movies. Man, that's so messed up. Let those movies just turn to a cinder. All right, let's look at... Uh, notice that God sees outside of that, but outside of that bed, what? Whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. That's judgment. See, I'm not kidding you. God's going to judge and burn Hollywood one day if you're not careful. That, I mean, and the Lord will do it one day. Man, you got to repent. It's so messed up. All right, let's uh, look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And then we'll read verse 14. Thank God for the book. Thank God for the book, man. Amen. Thank God for the book. Now look, uh, I don't want to be too hard on these people and think that I'm so judgmental. Oh, you're only, uh, that includes you too, sir. Yeah, there are so many times God could have shot me to nothingness a long time ago. Many times I deserved his judgment. So that's why we got to try our best. And God sees that and uh, he'll allow things and then he'll be merciful to you. All right? So we want God's grace to be shed upon everybody who's trying their best. But don't you dare abuse God's grace on that one. I mean, you take it so lightly. You don't care. This is so messed up. All right. Um, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 14. Even, notice right here that even with an unbeliever. So remember, God forbids that marriage with an unbeliever. But if you're already married to an unbeliever, God doesn't want you to divorce. And some people try to use that as an excuse to divorce. No, it doesn't matter. If you marry too late. So even if the person is an unbeliever, this is so powerful, sex. Sex is so powerful. God sees that act that you did with your unbelieving spouse is already sanctifying the person. And you think this is something you should play with, huh? All right, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 14. The Bible says, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. Wow! And the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they what? Holy. Holy. That's something, man. So God sees marriage, and remember, marriage is flesh joining flesh. It's something sacred and holy. How about that? Uh, look, uh, Song of Solomon, we won't turn over there, but it is filled with detail of so many things where a man and a woman, they do sexual things together. It is that apparent. So notice that even God puts that as part of inspired inspired scripture nothing wrong with that so that's a simple answer let's make it simple okay so this is something that's beautifully pure in god's eyes uh, as you try to sexually satisfy each other but as long as it's between the couple right we saw that hebrews 13 4 it's between the couple and the second thing is it respects their bodies it respects one another first corinthians chapter 7 Verse 3 through 4. Verse 3 through 4. So you got to realize that even some people, uh, whatever sexual action that they do, and some of the sexual actions that you hear about today, which is like, where do people do that kind of stuff? It's gotten so, it's gotten so off the wall. But you got to understand this. Even the liberals, 
when they talk about some type of sexual action, they even admit that it's condoned, it's allowable as long as it respects the other, as long as it respects the partner. So even an unbelieving mindset understands that. So the point is this, is that the point is, is that God keeps it simple and pure, right? Sex. So then all the specifics is going to be between you and God. And God's that type of person in scripture, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Sex is not the only one. There are so many things in life where God just keeps things simple. And then the specifics is going to have to be between you and God. But what can help you is when you know that one, it's between you and the spouse. And it's not, uh, it's not anybody else's business. And secondly, it's done to respect the person. So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 3. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Now that's so important. The opposite you would hear today is that women, uh, it's their body, it's their right, so I can dress and parade what I want. No, no, that's not the case. That's not your body. That's your husband's. Amen. So you have to think about your husband and you have to think about what respects the husband when you do that sexual encounter. And the same thing with men, with the women. And by the way, it's, uh, we've gotten so much to a messed up day and age where men do not respect their women. And the women complain about why, why are men such messed up perverts, etc. And they are abusive toward the women. Well, you got to realize this. Uh, one Berkeley girl had enough common sense when she wrote it in the comments. When people are talking about male chauvinist and abusive men, and rightfully so, she pointed out, but we women have a problem too. I don't like how we're dressed around in campus. Unsafe liberal. It's like we're asking to be raped, she says. All right, I'm okay. Let that uh, unsaved liberals sometimes have better sense than Calvary Chapel saved Christians, right? Yeah. And they whine about dress codes, you know? How about that? So the unsaved world, what they want to do is that they want to take something pure and simple and make it dirty. So then the best thing is, and I studied at Berkeley where they try to annihilate Song of Solomon trying to pull up every sexual detail and galore and try to make a seat. Man, what kind of a filthy mind would think something like that? Now, you know what their issue is? The simple answer is this. The simple answer is, remember, one, that the sexual actions, that the Lord considers it as sanctified. So he was sanctified as part of Scripture. Well, then, uh, why would Song of Solomon mention that? I mean, it's so filthy. Well, you know what your problem is? It's not filthy. If you really compare Song of Solomon language, all right, yeah. and there are thousands of Christians who don't think about something filthy when they read Song of Solomon except you. You know why? Because you're so used to filth. That's your problem. So when you come with a filthy heart, guess what? The Bible will give you what you want. Its wordings will come out filthy to you. But if you come out with pure, uh, pure and uh, simplicity, and beauty in your heart when you read Song of Solomon, the appreciation of pureness and beauty comes out. It's all from the heart. That's your problem. By the way, let's even erase the heart, okay? Let's be honest. You compare the language with Song of Solomon with today's dirty magazine, there's a clear difference. Unless you got rocks for brain, oh, excuse me, PhD from Berkeley, you do. It shows how much you want to dig into filth that you want to make the Bible filthy. You filthy professor, you. You're probably sleeping around with some students, aren't you? I just want to kick. I just want to kick this wicked world that they just, just they just take they just take they they take sex and take it so lightly and they try to pervert the Bible. Look, don't let the world scare you. All right, this is something that's a gift from God and it's pureness and beautiful. But we've turned. Uh, but now it became complicated, didn't it? Yeah. So we don't know boundary lines anymore, and we get questions, and we wonder why Song of Solomon is worded that way, etc. That's not God's fault. He was thinking pureness and simplicity when he did all that to begin with. It wasn't until stupid mankind start to complicate and anti it a little bit more uh -huh. that you don't know what's right and wrong anymore. So then the question comes out this way then. Well then, uh, if God was able to use uh, the language that is sexual in his scripture, can we be uh, like God and do the same thing? Well, that's the problem. You're not God. 
God does not or does not have a filthy mindset or a filthy heart Amen. when he talks about sex. Amen. He's already pure and he's thinking beauty. But guess what? You and I, it's too late. It's too late. We're born and bred into that. I mean, you got to realize it's very interesting where one Bible scholar mentioned, mentioned that the Old Testament, it would mention about sexual imagery, but then the Greeks took it so much to a far messed up pagan level that the New Testament hardly would mention about that. It doesn't mention sexual details. See, so mankind's already messed up. So you got to realize back then it was pureness and beauty, but now we just messed it up that we can't do that. We, we can't know. We cannot use sexual details like God would use. So look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. So I hope this helps a lot with the complicated boundary lines that the devil created and created a clearness of, look, sexual... Uh, sexual actions, there's nothing wrong about it, but there is something wrong about it when it's the wrong person, the wrong situation. Sexual specifics, there's nothing wrong with it, but it is wrong when it is outside the bedroom, and it is wrong when it dishonors and disrespects the other person when the other person doesn't want that, and it's used to an abusive level. And not only that, the key is also is, well then, the sexual language, can we restore to its beauty and pureness? No, you got to only let God do that. We can't do it today. It's so messed up. Because look at, uh, this is why sex education and sexual details, even in this teaching, have to be censored. Yeah. I can't just say it out of simplicity that blah, 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 beep, and you go, whoa, like that. I can't do that with simplicity and pureness. Like a child would do that. I cannot do that. You know why? Because we're too prone to filth already. Amen. It's so messed up. So that's why it has to be censored. Because look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Now, uh, look at this. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all what? Filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Let's look at Ephesians 5, 4. Oh my goodness, I'm past the time. I am so sorry. Let me wrap it up, okay? We are in our last two verses. Thank you for waiting, church. Thank you. This was an important teaching. Let me wrap it up quickly, okay? Look at Colossians 3, and we're going to look at Ephesians 5. Colossians 3 and Ephesians 5. Look, God... God allows sexual details because it's all from pureness, but see, what he forbids is filthiness. So see, we can't use sexual details like Song of Solomon would back then. Why? Because guess what? When you use those details, automatically, what is the person's first impression in the mind? Filthy. Yeah. And God says avoid filthiness. That's why we can't do it. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 4. Neither what? Filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient. Now, isn't this interesting? What accompanies filthiness? Usually when you do sexual language, what accompanies it? Foolish talking, right? Or joking, dirty jokes, and ta foolish talking about sex. See, that's what happens from what? Sexual details. Mm, how about that? Speaks volumes, Colossians 3. That's why I can't use sexual details. Why? Because it's going to be a natural tendency within people that, oh, oh, you heard what pastor said and stuff like that. See, that's wickedness. That's filthiness. Colossians chapter 3, verse 8. Now, this one will be the mo one of the most helpful verses I'm going to close it out with. Colossians 3, 8. But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, what? Filthy communication out of your mouth. Now look, you are not pure like God. And when you try to act like God, like, you're, like Lucifer does, trying to act like God, oh, I'm pure and I'll do it with simplicity, and then you try to give the sexual language that the Lord would use as Song of Solomon, guess what? Out of your communication, all of us is not going to think automatically, what pureness, what beauty. No, we're going to think, that's filthy. <laughs> so then see, you violate scripture with that filthy language out of your mouth. That's why we have to keep sexual details censored. And the best thing is what? It's between uh, you and the lover in the bed and none of our stinking business. Amen. All right, that's how it should be. Amen. That's why we're against, I'm against sex, sex education. Some people are so much into that. 
But you need to teach that because uh, otherwise you're going to grow up into an immature adult, you know. Oh, you're mature, so you should know about this. Oh, really? I have to become filthy to become mature. You're messed up. You're messed up, Frankenstein. So the thing is this, is that these guys are hypocrites. I have a question for them. Okay, you're talking about maturity. Why do women today have pregnancy and child rearing classes while they're pregnant? Why don't they have that a long time ago? Why is it until after marriage and they have a baby, they start doing these classes? So what's wrong with if uh, when we're married or, you know, uh, fiance status maybe, etc., when we're married and have the sex, if really people need to know about sex ed or the classes, why can't it be that time? Why does it have to be when you're a teenager for crying out loud, when they're horny and their mind is all about these two things? Man, you're so messed up, man. I mean, a bunch of hypocrites. You gotta know so you're a mature adult. Say that to any woman who's fornicating and then taking child rearing classes and pregnancy and call them immature. You bunch of hypocrites and liars, man. Better than a public school system cramming sex ed and now you get into gender studies and LGBTQ propaganda. That's your fruit. That's your fruit when you get into that kind of stuff. Besides, let's use common sense. Besides a public, before public school system came out cramming sex ed, gender studies, and 50,000 colors of the rainbow, LGBTQ, X, Y, and Z, stuff like that, Bible and ancient times, sex was very obvious to people without a public school system telling them what to do. Right. If they survive for 4,000 years, I think you can too. 5,000 years. My goodness, a couple hundred, 100 years, and you all throw a fit. Uh, all right, I hope today's lesson has helped. God, my Father, I pray tonight's teachings have opened our eyes in taking sex seriously. It's something that we should not repress against each other, but we should use the gift. And at the same time, it's something that we shouldn't take lightly, and we should maintain its pureness and beauty rather than uh, displaying the filth to the world, Heavenly Father, and being careful how we use it, and being clean in our conversation rather than filthy. And it also has justified and defended your scripture, uh, where it would justify and magnify sex in, as a gift, where we would be able to justify your wordings for it in the eyes of a perverted, messed up world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.